The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. Felix, what's this big ginormous console? It's my first game console. Oh. When I was a kid. Oh, the Atari 5200. Mm -hmm. Didn't this thing have really awful controllers? Yes, it did. They were terrible. They were so terrible, I had to stop playing it because they are just miserable. You know, Felix, we have some experience with gaming controllers. Mm -hmm. I bet we could build a better one. Hey, that's a great idea. Let's tear it apart, see what's inside, make a new controller. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired designs. Imhotep's priests. Regrettable acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. All right, the Atari 5200. So this was Atari's answer to other competing consoles back in 1982, such as the ColecoVision and the Intellivision. Surprised they didn't call it the Atari Vision. 5200 is 2600 times two, thus the 5200. Likewise, the 7800 was 5200 plus 2600, 7800. But at least their console numbers went in the right order, unlike Microsoft's. I don't know why this thing is so huge. I mean, look at this thing. Let's set an Xbox One on it. Also considered to be a large console. This thing could eat the Xbox One. See, like if we did this, you could completely occlude the view of the Xbox One. Atari was like, when we launch our console, it will blot out the sun. And a television's like, then we will fight in the shade. Atari had this bad habit of basically rebranding existing systems as new systems. So this thing is basically an Atari 400 computer repackaged as a game console. This one looks like, I think it actually did come from the floor of a barn. So there could be a lot of corrosion inside of it. The first version of this, for some reason, had a breakout box that would supply power to the console and then the RF signal was hidden in the power signal and then sent back to the box and then it goes into your television. Uh, Angry Video Game Nerd has a video explaining it in detail. Luckily this one is not it. I'm sure someone's like, ooh, look at this engineering trick we pulled off. And it's like, why? So I am intimately familiar with the Atari 8-bit computers because that was my first computer. So I'm expecting to see most of the same electronics inside of this thing. It's gonna be a 6502 based game system. MOS Technology 6502, I should say. The uh, old 2600, it was a 6507, which is just a 6502 with a reduced pin count to save money. But it was still basically the same thing. Oh my gosh, look at this thing. Look at this. This top portion, all it does is hold the controllers. Did people really go and say, oh, I'm going to neatly store away my controllers after playing Missile Command? Kids don't do that. See, that's what, that's what the controllers are supposed to go in there. Atari's like, let's just increase our tooling cost by 33%. Why not? Got the cartridge here. Big rusty RF shield. Oh my gosh, look at this heatsink. So this console is famous, or I would probably more appropriately infamous for, having terrible controllers because it had these um, analog sticks. So this is technically the first console with analog joysticks, but they would not self-center. So what I think they did here was they took the four controller ports that the Atari 400 computer had, basically combined two controller ports into one so they could have the controller with more buttons. We actually don't have the controllers here, but that's okay. We can find the schematics online and rebuild them that way. What is stuck? Oh, I guess I just needed to be tough. Like Sam Elliott. Oh, these pins are different. Usually they have twisty pins to remove the RF shield, but these are just bent over tabs. Well, at least we didn't find like any mouse poop inside of it. Ta-da! Well, looky here. Oh, pfft, oh my gosh. Look at that bodge. They inserted the chip with a pin just, I've never seen that bodge before. Like, look, what, look at that. They, <laughs> someone in the factory's like, okay, you have to bend out that pin before you stick it in. Insane. Let's see if I can uh, figure out what these are without even looking it up. Well, this is gonna be a mask ROM. That's pretty obvious there, because it has a reduced pin count. It's actually uh, more simplified than I, than I thought it would be. It's going to have a 6502 
CPU. There'll probably be a Pokey, a PIA, and a Antic and television adapter chip. But there's only four, so maybe they combine them into one chip. Um, over here, this is clearly the RAM. Oh look, more lovely bodges. Now, looking at this board, does anything stand out to you? Like the fact that there's hardly anything on it, but the board is the size of the moon? Yeah, that stands out to me too. So let's look up and mark these chips. Okay, I identified all of the main chips. We have the CPU here, which is going to be a custom version of the 6502 that Atari made. So you can't actually just plop in a stock 6502. Atari had their own part number for it. You can see here by C014806, and then it was made by Moss Technologies. That's what that logo is right there. Got the ROM, which boots the system, because this is technically just a computer. Pokey, which is a potentiometer and keyboard controller. And there's no PIA chip on this that they usually use for joysticks, so what they're probably doing is basically treating a lot of the buttons on the controllers as a keyboard, not necessarily up, down, left, right joystick control. Over here we have the Antic. This chip does the display list. It basically draws the screen. You know, has um, it has access to main the main memory, so it can actually put programs. It's it can put its own programs in RAM and then execute them to draw the screen. And then this is the GTIA, which is George's Television Interface Adapter. It's kind of like the TIA that's in the Atari 2600, except for instead of this one having to be constantly updated by the CPU, data is streamed to it by the Antic. So the Antic works as a graphics controller, creating the display based off the characters and everything. And then it um, sends its data to the GTIA. The GTIA adds the sprites, if applicable, and then sends the stream to your television. Over here we have the RAM. So each one of these is a 16 kilobit RAM. So if you think about it, this is what they would do back in the old days. They would have eight uh, RAM ICs and each one would store a bit of an 8-bit word. So, yeah, if you stored, you know, the value FF, it would actually be stored across all of these. So, these act as one word of memory. So, if it's 16 kilobits per chip, that means it's 16 kilobytes total. The Atari 400, I believe, had the same amount, and the Atari 800 had up to 48K. And, of course, it's 6502, so it can address up to 60 4K of memory. So what I think I'm going to do is look up the schematic for this so I can see how the Pokey chip interfaces with the controller ports. Yeah, so basically the controller ports are taking the place of a keyboard that you have obviously on one of the computers. So this is uh, DRAM according to what I found online. And uh, DRAM, dynamic RAM, it's cheaper and it has better density but it uses a capacitor to store the bit which means after a certain amount of time it will actually lose its data. So it has to be constantly refreshed. So one thing that made the Z80 CPU popular is that it could do automatic refresh of RAM attached to it. 6502 CPU could not, so I'm guessing probably some of the circuitry is used for the refresh, although the refresh might also be built into the Antic. I'll have to look that up. Well, I mean, there's not a whole lot to see here. I mean, yeah, CPU, I.O. interface, program ROM to bootstrap the system before you go to the cartridge. Basically your graphics generator and then your TV controller. RAM, associated glue logic chips, uh, your soft power switch, driver here, RF controller, um, two power regulators on one really weird bent metal heat sink. Oh, and this is going to be your um, audio and video circuitry here. Basically takes the digital signals off of this, converts it into analog, and then it is turned into an RF signal so it can be transmitted to your TV over the RF adapter. So we probably could get a pretty clean composite signal from this area right here. So yeah, that's pretty much all that's in the Atari 5200. Um, a huge system, basically just for five chips. I mean, look at that, see? So I took this vector drawing from Illustrator and I brought it over into Fusion 360. So I've extruded this up into all the different parts. So we have a PCB. Felix has since done more design on the PCB, so we have an open area here so the cord can snake in, loop around on a uh, strain relief, and then go down to the actual 
solder points. That way when you pull on the cord, you're not pulling on the solder points, you're pulling on the strain relief tab. I have a analog stick here. I also had a, uh, a sphere that I drew around it. Now it looks like the, the bubble that the evil witch comes from, or no, the good witch in uh, Wizard of Oz. It represents the diameter of the rotation of the, the analog stick thing. So the reason I did that was so I had something I could subtract from the part that goes around. I call it the analog cover, right? So that's the analog cover. But if we look at the analog cover from the bottom, we will see, yeah, the ball has subtracted from the inside of it, which gives us the clearance we need for the joystick. So we also have the keypad. Originally, I was going to have like a uh, piece of engraving plastic around the keypad, but I don't know if we necessarily need that now. I think I might want to just make this like like this, basically. So we have the front like that. Then in the back, um, it's pretty straightforward. I'm using a, uh, a chamfer instead of a fillet here because I was having trouble filleting this. And also the uh, the chamfer looks more like a 5200 cartridge. See, it's uh, it's squared off at 45 degrees. It's not rounded. And of course, there's the two buttons which go here. The two buttons sit on top of the PCB like this. Yeah, it's working out pretty well. Okay, I soldered in the digital potentiometer right there. It is an analog device's AD5242. The last number meaning that it's a dual potentiometer for up and down. So basically we're gonna take the, you know, video game analog stick, modern video game analog stick, and convert its values to something the Atari can use. Now we have this code here that we uh, wrote before, but this is an I squared C device. So let's go down and look at the instructions for it. Okay, so this is the information we need to know. So we need to include wire, which is what Arduino calls I squared C. And then, yeah, so let's just create a separate function, void send pot. So, oh, in setup, we need to do wire begin. Uh, so the uh, top two ADCs, analog digital converters on the Arduino uh, or the ATmega 328P, they get used for I squared C. Begin transmission. Okay, so over here we see that slave address byte. So let's look at that in uh, binary. So it's 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and then there was two physical address lines. Felix tied those both low. So it's that. And what is that in decimal and hex? 44 or 2C in hex. Okay, we'll just use 44. Let's go back over here. So we're going to begin transmission on device 20, uh, 44. So you can set multiple address bits physically on the package to have, well, you could have up to four of these on one I squared C line. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is write our instruction byte, and that's going to be this byte right here. So we have eight bits. Bottom three don't do anything. The only ones that matter are the upper ones. So the first bit is the uh, RDAC sub address select, so either the first one or the second one. So let's send the, the first one first, so that'll be a zero. Uh, we don't want to reset it, we don't want to shut it down, so basically it'll just be all zeros, okay. There's also two uh, digital I.O. you can use here. Uh, we don't need those for anything. They probably just had extra pins lying around, and they're like, hey, let's do something with this. So we're gonna write a byte, and it's going to be zero, zero. Cool. All right, so we've said, okay, we're gonna send you a value for the first potentiometer. So now we need to send the value and that's the data byte. And that's just going to be, you know, whatever the byte is. So wire write exposition, kind of like when you write a story and you're like, oh, and that's why I want revenge for my murdered family. Oh, thanks for the exposition. Okay, so we're gonna start the transmission and end the transmission. Now we have to actually start the transmission again to send the, send the other byte. So we're gonna basically copy paste this do it again, but this time we're going to set the high bit to select the, the second potentiometer. So we'll just put an eight there and then we're going to send the Y position. All right, let's see if this compiles. Okay, it looks like it does. All right, let's test this out on the Atari and see if it works. All right, time to play Pac-Man. Look at this super long cord. This is like three times longer than the NES Classic cord. I'm gonna go to the super hard level. Atari level, start. Okay, here we go. I don't have speakers on this monitor. Oh, got you, sucker. I wonder if this is where they got the idea for Ghostbusters. 
Why don't they make like Eddie Murphy movies like they used to? Oh, I can eat an Atari symbol. I'm gonna be a donkey forever. I'm surprised Mike Myers hasn't crawled back to Austin Powers yet. That has to happen. I mean, this seems to work pretty well. I mean, I just have a really hard level that I can't beat. These grooves are just cool. Straight up. They match the cartridge. Oh, this takes a little bit of understanding, doesn't it? This, it's a, oh, turtles! Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Come on, little turtle. Come on, little turtle. Woo, little turtle. There's fireballs. Come in, come, whoa, we're going to turtle now. Woo, little turtle. Oof. Oh, I went right over that fireball. I think I defeated the level. Just like a professional Mario. Just like a professional plumber here. Ben, you did a great design with the uh, controller here. Thank you. It's always good to start with foam core and then worry about the computer stuff. I had fun making that. Uh, PCB? Yeah, that was fun too. Yeah, I wonder if anyone would buy something like this. I bet somebody would. Yeah, turned out pretty good. I had some trouble with the complex uh, curve for the uh, fillet on it. I wanted to have it be a chamfer on the bottom and a fillet on the top. Well, there you have it. We made a better version of the terrible Atari 5200 controller, although it's not hard to make a better version of it. What were your favorite consoles as a kid? Did you have any controllers that you didn't like? Please leave your comments at element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Hey, let's play Pac-Man. Oh yeah. Okay, I identified all of the main chips, except for the one that I forgot to label. I thought this console would be bigger. Well, I don't know if I can part with that rusty oil can I've had for 50 years. I'm really attached to that rusty oil can. Karen, it looks like you've got one of those cool new portable mini arcades. So maybe we can make it better. Oh yeah, kind of like the Oregon Trail project. Yeah! And then shrink it down, just like we did with the Oregon Trail electronic game, to actually get this into keychain sized range. It'd be like Pocket Pac-Man! This thing's gonna be like, I don't know what I am. Who am I?